Why is open data publishing still broken? Um, and yeah, I got into, I've been in the industry for a long time, about 12 years ago or 10 years ago, I met the founders when I was working for a government department and they issued an official information act request asking for some data sets. And I was like, yes, <laughs> we need this. We need to get this data out there. And that was 10 years ago and I was all excited. And it's 10 years later and we still have a whole bunch of issues that we need to work through to get data published. So this is why we're still broken. Um, so anyway, I'll just introduce coordinates because I'm aware that there's a whole bunch of people here from all over the world. Um, we're a technology, we are a technology company. We are born out of the open data movement um, and we've built a data management platform. Um, we help organisations and professionals to manage, publish and share and use data. It's pretty simple. Our platform helps people get the value from their data sets. And as we'll discuss today, we think that geospatial data is a well underutilised asset and we think that technology can play a major role in real realising its potential. Um, if you haven't heard of us, you may have heard of some of our customers or the, um, used some of their sites to access data. We're really proud of what our customers are achieving using our technology. Um, it's seriously world-leading work. We have um, government agencies publishing open data, private companies who are managing and sharing, privately sharing their own data sets. Um, we have NGOs and startups building their own apps using our management platform. So um, as we were putting together this talk, and we're very aware that I've given this, like, this realisation of this talk before, um, and I'll keep doing it until like, open data is free and open and everywhere. Um, yeah, so I've been doing it about four years, and coordinates have been thinking and working on it since 2008, and we believe that many of the problems are still the same as they were um, 10 years ago. So government agencies find it hard to publish data, users find it really hard to access data, and we started on solving this problem in a really binary way. But yeah, I just want to reinforce that, that being at this conference and chatting to heaps of people yesterday is validating our thinking that it is still really challenging. Like I've talked to people from different countries who are saying and experiencing the same problems that we do experience here and that I did 10 years ago. There's a bit of inequality as well, like there's like fast movement in some areas and slower in others, but yeah, this is, I'm getting a lot of validation, this is still a problem. Um, so yeah, we started on it thinking about it in a really binary way. So we have publishers getting data into a platform and then users using or downloading the data or yeah, using APIs. So, and that's what this diagram here was about, and this is where we started, was thinking on the black side, that is publishers publishing data, and on the green side, near me, we have the users, how users want to access data. So we started here, we were like, there's a life cycle, there's two sides to this coin, here's how we can solve open data, um, it's going to be awesome, we did it, yay, but... This is only part of the problem. This is the first step. And it's awesome that we believe we've reached this, but we have to see this as the first step in a journey, and this is the tip of the iceberg. And why I'm saying that this way of thinking is only that first step and is important to recognize is that, is if we stop here, it's wrong because as we just had in a panel before, we're talking about communities. Open data is about people being able to share and collaborate and operate as an ecosystem. So looking at it in this binary way is a very great first start, but it doesn't represent the complex networks of what sharing geospatial and really true open data actually is. Um, so when I was thinking about this problem, it's about data distribution being really complicated. 
Um, I thought about, for example, my time when I was working at Department of Conservation. So for people from outside of New Zealand, if you go out to our forests or our streams, you might um, find yourself on dock land. It's about a third of the country. And at one point I was the sole geospatial analyst in the national office. So they had all these conservancies who had teams. But um, I would get some of the ministerial level questions. And one of them was, could I please find all the wilding pines across New Zealand that had been removed between 1989 and 2009? And I was like, oh, that's a great GIS problem. Thank you. And they're like, can you do that? Or someone was like, yeah, GIS can do that. And you're like, yeah, in concept. So I had a little problem there. We had to get out to all of the rangers who, who would even know who'd been there in 1989. Um, and we, yeah, we did it. So, yeah. <laughs> um, we had to go to all the rangers that had done the work. And this was for carbon accounting, by the way. That's why they wanted to know. And also, just to give you a definition, um, pine trees are not native to New Zealand. They're used in our forestry. And sometimes those seeds float or birds poop them out and we get pine trees growing in our native forests. And we don't want that because it changes the ecosystem. And they're really, really hard to get out. So, and the other thing was the Ministry for the Environment were like, we might get taxed on these. We might have this massive bill because we've taken all these pest trees out and we don't want to pay it. So, yeah, that's why we had to do that. So we went out to all these ranges and these people, you know, this sporadic internet connection. Um, they're in really remote areas and we had to s figure out where these were and they had to get data back to us and then we had to collate it nationally and then give the ministry some kind of answer and just explain the caveats of, like, how to manage, use this information. Um, so we had to deliver a way for those rangers to deliver spatial information back to us and people were physically drawing on photos and I know people are still working like that today where it's just sometimes they're like it's just easier if I draw on this thing and give it to you yeah so the production of and distribution of geospatial data involves an extremely complex networks of transactions it's not just a simple someone makes some data and somebody else uses some data it is a series of um, actors across multiple organisations, all doing critical work, often using quite labour-intensive methods, and also it's all—it's an opportunity for that community to come together and participate. Yeah. Um, another example I was thinking about, as you can see, I've got a bit of a conservation theme to this, is about pest control. So as People may know, um, or New Zealanders, well, New Zealand's got a really ambitious target of becoming predator free by 2050, and that's so that our native um, species can thrive and we can work on our biodiversity. Um, so, this has helped catalyze an enormous network of volunteer groups, local and central government agencies, NGOs, businesses, and individuals all working together in um, various ways. One of the ways they're going to do work together is using data sets. Um, and this is the only way that government is going to be able to track the progress of New Zealand becoming predator-free by 2050. Also, there are going to be hundreds of disparate, frequently updated data sets. My point here isn't to comment on what tools they are using, um, so much as to highlight the complexity of what's going on. Again, this isn't a straight producer... Um, user relationship. It's a massively complex network with an enormous number of potential transactions across many different nodes. Um, so those are my examples of things that I'm really passionate about and working on, but I want to give you, um, especially for the Australians in the room, um, a look at how data distribution works in a, in a business setting um, across the Tasman. So this is a crude outline of how property data flows across various nodes. Um, in Australia, compared with New Zealand, they have an extra level of government um, at state, state level and a commercial data aggregator owned by the states at a federal level. 
So you also have a phenomenal amount of councils versus our 60. Um, so this is really interesting for open data people because our usual model of thinking about open data is government has the data, government releases data, professional uses data. But it's way more complex than that because we've got this several tiers and then a, um, a aggregator in the middle. Um, so a lot of discussion around open data is based on this sort of model. And this is, again, with that, that flow diagram I showed you before. This is the same. It's an A to B model. And now we've thought more about this as a company. And the more we've realized that this is not how data distribution works. It's a massive simplification. And that simplification has implications for how we think about solving the problem of open data. Which brings me to, this is what we think um, geospatial data distribution actually looks like. You might call it a directly connected network, um, where organisations have multiple sources lying upstream from them for a particular data set, and other organisations lying downstream. And the really complex thing is that this model changes for every data set. An organisation might be the upstream source for data set A, but a midstream node for data set B. And the even greater complexifier is that these transactions also happen internally for an organisation, where staff members will take local copies and edit them for their own specific purposes. Um, and this is a problem for many organisations from a data management point of view, as you get many disparate copies of data and it can be really hard and expensive to manage updates when they come through. So what's going on with each of these transactions? We've, we've seen a bunch of operations going on at each of those nodes to make the data they have fit sourced fit for their specific purpose. It might be edited in a GIS, it might be clipped, it might have its attributes renamed, um, it might be combined with one or more other data sets to make a new product. There are actually dozens of potential operations that are used to make data fit for purpose and to add value. This is really similar to how products are made in other industries. There's even a word for it, which is supply chain. Our working hypothesis is that every organisation on the planet that produces or uses geospatial data is actually in a supply chain. Part of that chain may involve accessing open data um, and authoritative data from government agencies, which are fundamental to the operation of the supply chain. But that public side of the chain is by no means the entire picture. And the underlying point is that we need to be building end-to-end -end solutions for the flows across these supply chains and that we won't actually solve the problem of open data until we do. Um, so at present, the supply chain is broken. It is really, really hard to maintain. It's big, it's complex, it, rise, it requires expensive tools and a lot of labour. Um, it's creaky. Um, also, the people who are at the bottom of the supply chain are often using data that's quite out of date because it is an absolute mission to go through and go right through the whole thing to update your data set. Um, it's all well and good and awesome that government agencies are aiming to release more frequently updated data. That's rad. But if you can't consume it and if you can't go through and quickly consume and pull in those updates, that can create new problems and there is quite a big cost to it. Um, so basically we need to radically streamline how data moves across the entire ge geospatial ecosystem. This means making it much easier and cheaper for data to move between multiple organisations and individuals. Um, so what have we done? The first thing is we've entirely rebuilt um, our, the data management application. This work is complete now and involved building a whole new suite of new and improved features, including data drafts, set management, smart data uploads, advanced XML metadata management, better attachments and more. So lots of features built specifically for geospatial data management. 
user-friendly data management is really at the crux of this problem. So that's where we've started and that's the core of the product that we've built. Um, and everyone who uses geospatial data has a data management problem. And everyone who interacts with geospatial data is interacting with other organisations, even if it's just downloading data. So we've worked really hard to make it easy for anyone just to drag and drop GIS data and have it all ready to preview in the portal to, um, to share, export, build apps using our APIs. Um, we also are introducing data forking. So this is a really exciting, really, really exciting step for us. Um, in terms of, this is a familiar word for the GitHub users. Basically, we're thinking of it as another ingestion option for getting data, set, data into your coordinates account. Um, so currently, you can have a coordinates account where a lot of people who do are downloading data or using it via the APIs, and we've changed that to, so that people can now upload their own data in there and fork data from other organisations. So those are two massive changes that we've made. And the benefit of forking is that, um, so I'll just explain it a little further. If Department A wanted to get a copy of Department B's data, they could fork the data down and immediately get it. And the benefits of forking is it allows updates to flow much more easily into the systems of the, down, of the downstream organisations. So this first cut of forking is now live on coordinates for our customers. Um, new customers can sign up and fork any of the 15,000 public layers that we have on the platform at the moment into, the, into your account. And so this has only been released yesterday. So that's why we're really, really excited. And if you want to come and see it, come and find us on our stand. We'd love to talk about it. Um, I have 1 minute 30. Um, during the forking process, we're going to add some new things like spatial data, filtering, um, buffering, calculator, spatial joins. So all those things you might need to tidy up your data when it comes in. So it's not doing hard out grunty analysis, it's just doing that tidy up so you can then consume it in another way. Um, and another thing that we're doing is we want to make it really cheap and free in some cases. So what that means is for all those people out there who have say one or two data sets that you want to make open so that other people can share and use it, we're going to make that free up to 300 megs of vector data and a gig of raster data. So that is how we want to kickstart and just get as much as people can and just drop that barrier to entry because I just think of all those people out there who have done research or done volunteer projects that you can just get it up there and shared yeah, under a Creative Commons licence. That's the only catch with it. Um, in parallel, we've also been working on a really, truly radical solution to the problem of data collaboration. Um, it's been in development for a good 18 months. The, it's still in alpha release. We'll be making a lot of noise about this around um, in about April 2020. Some of you in this room already know about it. Um, I'm not allowed to say much, but it actually promises to solve the problem of collaboration and version control in um, of geospatial data. And also the other really exciting thing is we'll be open sourcing this solution next year as soon as we're out of alpha. Um, and again, if you're interested, please come and have a chat to us because with these two, all this development that's going on, we're looking for people who are really keen to be pro VIP users that we can release this to to get the feedback because the way we work is we iterate and we need the feedback from the core community to make sure that it does actually work for you. So when we're promising to solve these problems, your testing and making sure it fits in your workflow. Thank you. Cool. <laughs>